Okay, so we all know Shira is all about love. In the end, love quite literally saves the world. But how and why does it save the world? I think Shira's been trying to tell us something all along. Its motifs, world building, and characters work together to make the best case for love I think I've seen in a long time. I've got a lot to say about this one, so let's jump right in. A thematic throughline of the show is the conflict of love versus power. Now, it's a classic. We've seen it in Avatar, when Aang was told to let go of attachments so that he could access the Avatar state, this force he needed to save the world. Sound familiar? I think this conflict is explored so successfully in Shira because of the way it's baked into the emotional crux of the story, the push-pull relationship between Adora and Katra. See, Katra and Adora were raised by someone we could very plainly label as an abuser. Shadow Weaver projected her own pathologies on these children from basically day one. She is the one who ingrains in them the belief that a harsh world requires strength, so naturally vulnerability is what impedes this strength. I was hard on you, I won't deny it, and I won't apologize. I just wanted to prepare you for the world. I wanted you to be strong. Shadow Weaver is driven by her desire for power. She gets pretty far in Mysticorp, but then leaves her co-sorcerers for Hordak pretty much on a dime. Shadow Weaver's power is opportunistic. It's her bargaining chip that keeps her alive. She's always going to be on the winning side, not because she believes in the cause, but because that's where she'll be safe. Now, in the Horde, she takes on the new, exciting responsibility of traumatizing two young girls. It'd be funny if she weren't such a terrible person. On Adora, she projects her ambitions. A child with some untapped, innate power would have been so appealing to a person like her. And on Katra, she projects her insecurities. Her disgust towards Katra probably compounded by the fact that her prodigy golden child Adora actually wanted Katra around. In Season 2, Episode 6, Light Spinner, her self-identification with Katra is made pretty explicit. Why was I never good enough for you? Really, I want to know. Because you remind me of myself. You always have. Nothing was ever easy for me either. And so these two girls are forced to reenact their abuser's warped worldview over and over and over until... Enough! This isn't about you and your messed up power trip anymore. Now. I may be reaching, but it's even in her name. Shadow Weaver. She weaves shadows, literally the dark reflections of an object or a person, that are distorted beyond what the thing actually is. Shadow Weaver warped Katra and Adora's perception of love to the point that they deny any affection they had to each other's faces, all while demonstrably having some sort of feelings for each other. Now, as we look at how their arcs play out this love-power conflict, Let's take note of some recurring themes. Notice the words that characterize this conflict and how they evolve over the series. Left, chose, win, want, and love. Left. She left us. She left me. She left me behind too, like I was nothing. Didn't need you. <laughs> left you. Catra focuses on her feelings of abandonment. Without ever having said the word love, she knows that Adora left whatever connection they had for something better. New friends, a sword, and a power that Katra can't comprehend. Chose. She chose her side, I chose mine. That's what you'll always choose. Adora chose Shadow Weaver, okay? Not me! Not only is love weakness, there's a limited supply of it in Katra's mind. If Adora chooses Glimmer, Bo, and Shira, she can't be choosing Katra. Because that's what Shadow Weaver did, right? Their whole lives, her favoritism of Adora went hand in hand with her discarding Katra. In her mind, the two were synonymous. Win. That means we win and you lose. Oh, I'm going to make sure we win. I won't let you win. I thought winning would be different. Notice how frequently Katra uses this word as she continues to unravel. The world is harsh and fair, and one made up of absolutes. She's lost her whole life, so the solution is to win. Adora is the cause of her pain, so the solution is to defeat her. We see here that, at the end, she's still trapped in Shadow Weaver's narrative, despite telling herself that she's proving her wrong. But freedom, true freedom, 
comes from realizing that narratives were never ours to dismantle in the first place. The more we commit to disproving someone's idea of us, the more we're actually giving that idea power. Catra hasn't figured that out yet, here. But give her time. Want. Is this not what you've wanted since you were old enough to want? Is that what you really want? To rule the world? I mean, yeah, obviously. Isn't that what you want, too? We both know this was never what you really wanted. What do you want, Adora? Uh, Adora doesn't want me! What do you want when this is all over? Now, this... This is the big one. This word is so important to them both. Growing up, they were treated by the adults in their lives as resources, rather than actual people. There was no room for want, except what they were told to want. Want. Double Trouble uses this word in an 11th hour, scathing takedown of Katra at her lowest. What did she want? They probably never would have actually asked themselves this question, because to want is to allow space for the self. And the thing about the kind of abuse Adora and Katra endured is just how detached it is from this self. The question isn't, what do I want? It's, how do I stay on her good side so I am not punished, so I don't suffer? This survival mode is a state of chronic stress, self-neglect, and uncalibrated emotions. Here, we can't access our authentic self. The self that does emerge is a distorted one, on autopilot, keeping us safe the only way it knows how. And that's the kicker, isn't it? This person in survival mode is a part of us, but isn't actually who we are. So, want? Want had no place here. And as for Adora and Catcher's wants? Well, we know that. But it's only when all else is stripped away, the embodiment of their childhood gone, that they're able to say it. Which brings us to the final word in this little outline of ours. Love. They're at the failsafe, literally in the heart of the planet. Adora's subconscious shows her in detail her love for Katra, and Katra is finally unafraid to give hers away. So before the world swallows her and her stupid, reckless girl, then so be it. She loves. And here, where there is love, there is power. And they were wrong. Light Hope, Shadow Weaver, Horde Prime. So in season four, Adora loses the ability to turn into Shira, the weapon, the instrument of war. She's unable to become her mechanically through the sword. But as the season goes on, we see glimpses of Shira's unrestrained power break through, even implying that the sword itself wasn't what liberated the power, but actually kept it in check. Despite this, Shadow Weaver cautions Adora that it's only through suppressing her confusing emotions for Katra that she'll access Shira that love, allegedly, is an impediment to the clarity she needs. But in fact, love is clarity. We never see Adora more focused than when she channels She-Ra in Season 5, and it's through love. Against logic, against self-preservation, to see the odds and take the gamble anyway, because something, or someone, is worth the risk. There's nothing more clear-headed than that. Look at this scene. By all accounts, this looks hopeless, right? They're both physically broken, surrounded, in the heart of enemy territory with no backup. You could perfectly argue it made no strategic sense. And yet, it's the one thing Prime, in all his calculating genius, doesn't account for. And it's love that saves them both, in the end. So why? Why is love this power? We could come up with a bunch of poetic reasons, but fundamentally, I think it's that love helps us express our authentic self. That authentic self we talked about before that can get pushed down and corroded by fear. Because when Adora and Katra accepted their love over fear, that's what saved the world. So power and love share the fact that they're both sources of safety, but of two very different kinds. Are you safe because you've accumulated enough influence to keep those around you in check? Or have you developed closeness and connection enough to know that you don't have to? Newly outfitted with Glimmer's boots, Bo's heart, and Catra's crown, the new Shira isn't a weapon, it's a celebration of connection. And it's that same human connection that motivates the decisions that turn the tides in battle, 
human connection that reaches through to those who were chipped. And as Prime is defeated, it's clear. The conflict was never love or power. It was authentic connection versus outside manipulation. Our genuine selves against the constructs imposed on us. And this contrast between natural and artificial has been a steady motif from the start of the show. Let me explain. So, since season one, magic and nature have been associated with one another and juxtaposed with things that are mechanical. Think even just the landscape of the Ethereum woods versus the polluted wasteland look of the Horde. Horde Prime is consistently associated with the artificial. Horde Prime is on you. He he's hacking into the planet. Every part of the machine is of value. He and his ship are all jagged edges, creepy sterile white, sickly green. Then on Critus, it's very deliberately revealed that his one weakness is magic. Magic is natural, it's a part of the planet. And then magic is thematically linked to love. Shadow Weaver describes Shira as a being of pure magic, and then we see Shira's pure form activated by care for others. So Prime's weakness to magic might as well be weakness to love, something he apparently tries to overcompensate for with his Ethereans are so predictable with their emotions and I see all routine. But neither love nor magic can be quantified, constructed, or controlled. Like nature, they're living things that grow on their own. So love saves the world, magic envelops the planet, and the natural supplants the industrial. Prime's ship is engulfed by a tree. It's even fitting that Perfuma, with her plant power, is the one who makes the most compelling case for vulnerability to Catra, a product of the machine-like Horde upbringing. So here, the interpersonal, intrapersonal, and environmental conflicts all mirror each other. And with the season's focus on the mind control chips, we're brought full circle to the show's commentary on abuse. See, Prime's chips work very well as metaphors for the effects of abuse and trauma. The series has shown us, at different points, people being controlled and manipulated for the benefit of others, whether through chips, the sword, or just their emotions. And each time, the manipulator was threatened by love. Light Hope even erased her own memory of warmth for Mara in the name of the mission. Prime's chips are artificial, but so is abusive conditioning, in the way that both lead us away from who we are in favor of imposing on us someone else's identity or reality. The Sword of Protection itself was an attempt by others to co-opt Adora's power. Season 5 Shira is what happens when she found her own. We don't access our own full potential by denying parts of ourselves. Adora shatters the sword, and she finds herself, her love, and her greatest power all at once. Surrounded by her rebellion family and motivated by her love for them, she only glitches out of Shira when she sees Shadow Weaver, the one who, an episode ago, told her to reject love. Both Prime and Shadow Weaver treat those beneath them as extensions of themselves, rather than people with feelings and aspirations. They used different behavioral or technical methods, but the effect is the same. A person's agency and identity suppressed for their benefit. But we are not the expectations of us. However outside forces might try, we belong to ourselves. Consider in this context this quote from Bo to Scorpia. Prime may have made you do a lot of things, but he can't turn you into something you're not. Those who try to control others reject connection in doing so, and without connection, they're simply weaker. And Trapta pretty much sums it up. You can't control us! You don't understand what makes us strong, and that's why you'll never win! Love and the bonds we have with each other give us something worth fighting for, and that's just the stronger why. And the finale emphasizes this with the sheer number of I love yous we get between characters. I love you guys so much. Oh, I love you. I love you too. Cause I love you, dearest. I love you, dad. And of course, I love you. I love you too. Without having been child soldiers, we all might have wounds that feel inevitable to us. Like, we can't tell where our pain ends and we begin. Pain doesn't explain itself to us, it just comes. And often, the worst part isn't just sitting in our own darkness, but feeling like we're doomed to be the only ones who can see it. Pain doesn't explain itself to us, but love doesn't either. 
We could break love into all its component whys, and it still wouldn't add up to the warmth of a hug or the comfort of a hand to hold. Life isn't always gentle. That's just part of the deal, and it's not up to us. But to be kind in spite of it is our choice. And as a battle fought for love breathes new life into the ground, we see that kindness inform the world around it for the better. And maybe it doesn't always happen. But if there's a place for fiction, I think it's for hope. The universe might be indifferent, but we don't have to be. Does this mean love has to save us? Or that it's the end all to our journeys? I don't think it's that simple. But we're not monsters for wanting to be cared for. And I don't think it's naive to believe that love can help us heal. And this absolutely includes love towards ourselves. After all, a big part of Adora saving herself was believing that she deserved a future. Perfection and power are overrated. I think you are very wise to choose happiness and love. Where she wasn't just a soldier, a martyr, or a weapon. Just Adora. Late to Scorpia's first ball. Whatever you call them, narratives, expectations, these things that tell us who we are, really are just about control. And control is just another word for predictability. Adora will make me proud. Catra won't ever amount to anything. Will. Won't. But the world is nothing but unpredictable. Adora leaves. Micah survived. Catra saves Glimmer. Shadow Weaver sacrifices herself. Bo has parents. Catra has a cute sneeze. People can leave you. They can hurt you, even if they don't mean to. So what? So what? Control is hard to come by, and I don't think it's the point. A forest isn't beautiful because we commanded it to grow. A song doesn't make us feel something because we know how it ends. Genuine connection isn't a grasp for control, but a desire to share. And it's those things we share that I think make life sweetest. Sharing music, a meal, laughing until our stomach hurts, sleepovers. And in the space between people sharing love, we create something new. Because I think there's one more word. Home. I'm going to take you home. You're going home. I... I want to go home. Home looks different to all of us. A different skyline, different smells, different laughter. So I think it's defined best just by the way it makes us feel. Safe. And comfortably ourselves. Because that's where it really all started. Adora left, and Catra thought she'd never see home again. But they finally found each other again, and suddenly, home wasn't a place to go back to. I think home is, through love, life made greater than the sum of its parts. Where, despite doubts we might have about ourselves, or what we've seen the world to be, together, even for moments, we can have peace. And maybe that's magic.